Lecture 9 Fate and Free Will in Mythology No nation, no civilization, has surpassed the ancient Greeks in its mythopoetic imagination. And no civilization has surpassed the Greeks in its use of mythology to convey the most profound thoughts about human existence. The Athenian drama, the tragedies, were the supreme vehicle for conveying these moral truths to be discovered in the ancient mythology, the ancient history of Greece. The Athenian tragedy was the characteristic cultural statement of the Athenian democracy. No other Greek nation, no other Greek city-state had a tragedy. They imported the Athenian ones and enjoyed them enormously, but it was characteristic of Athens. We are the heirs of the Athenian democracy. Our values are the values of democratic Athens. The Athenians believed themselves to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. They were law-abiding people with a constitution. They believed in an open society where you were free to live your life as you chose. They believed in a free market economy that brought the goods from the whole world into Athens. And they were liberal with their immigration policies. And all over the Greek world, men and women flocked to Athens to make a good livelihood for themselves, to make a better life for their children, and to partake of the intellectual excitement unleashed by the Athenian democracy. The Athenian democracy and our own age are the two most creative periods in history. In the Athenian democracy, scientific history was first practice. Scientific medicine was first practice. Art and architecture of Athens became our defining criterion for what is classical. And the lively intellectual life at Athens attracted scholars and thinkers from all over Greece. And there grew up in Athens a whole educational system, almost a university system, in which you studied under these intellectuals who had come from all over Greece, men like Protagoras. They were the sophist, the wise men, but we can call them professors. They earned their livelihood by lecturing. Uh, and in fact, if you wanted to send your son to study at one of these universities, it was about the same as to send him today to, or her today, to Harvard. And these sophists had as their primary goal to make your child successful. And in Athens, success was completely determined by your role in politics. As Pericles said, we don't hold that a person who has no interest in politics is minding his own business. If he's not interested in politics, he has no business being in Athens. Every citizen was expected to participate as fully as possible in the decision-making of the Athenian democracy. And the key to success was your ability to speak well, to make any argument seem good. And to do this, the sophist also led you to question every value. In fact, in this brave new age of Athens, with its status as a superpower, its great navy, it came to be questioned whether there were any such things as eternal right and wrong. And the sophists taught that there was no such thing as absolute right and absolute wrong. For example, is cannibalism always wrong? Well, you would come home on spring break, your father would ask you what you had learned that semester, and you would say, Dad, I've learned that cannibalism is just fine. <laughs> what do you mean cannibalism is fine? Well, the king of Persia brought in a uh, a group of Greeks, and he asked them how much they would take in money to knock their grandfather in the head and eat him. Well, they were shocked. 
No amount of money would lead them to do that. Then he brought in a, gr a group of Indians from India. I asked them how much money they would take not to eat their grandfather. Well, they were shocked because when their grandfather grew old, it was a sign of honor to knock him in the head, boil him up, and eat him. That way he's always with us. Well, I'm not sending you back to that school, but even as today parents are upset by what their children learn, you send him back because he needed that credential, needed that training. And it was in this atmosphere of questioning all, all traditional values, like the gods. And Protagoras the sophist said, man is the measure of all things. Of the gods we cannot know, nor can we know whether the gods even care what humans do. The gods may not exist. If they do exist, they may very well not care what humans do. And there most certainly are not any absolute values, absolute right and wrong. In fact, such ideas as absolute right and wrong, such ideas as the law, are simply a means by which the powerful exercise their domination over the weak. Even the gods are the creation of the powerful to dominate the weak through their superstitions. It was in this climate that the Athenian tragedy developed. In an effort to examine within the civic forum of all the Athenians coming together, to examine whether or not there were consequences to wrong deeds and who are the gods. The first of these great playwrights was Aeschylus. He was a man of youth when the Battle of Marathon was fought. Like every Athenian, he believed it was the noblest thing you could do to die for your country. And when he passed away, old and full of honors, he didn't have on his tombstone this is Aeschylus, author of the Oresteia. No, he had simply, this tomb, the bones of Aeschylus doth hide. Euphorian son, fair Gila's pride. How famed his valor, Marathon may tell, and long-haired Persians who knew it all too well. That is what he wanted to remember, that he had fought at that decisive battle in 490 B.C., for his country. He was a profound intellect and deeply religious, and his plays all deal with this question of who are the gods and do the gods demand righteousness? Who is Zeus and how does Zeus relate to fate? Are the gods themselves bound by fate? These questions, of course, are still with us today. I believe that every person makes a decision to believe in God or not to believe in God. If you refuse to make that decision, you've already made it. I believe every person makes the decision to believe that everything in life is fated or that he or she has free will. And once again, if you just deny that or laugh about it, you've already made that decision. And in his most profound plays, the Oresteia, Aeschylus examines this question, the gods of fate, but also are there families that are cursed, that generation after generation must go through horrors? And the house of Atreus, was the great example. Aeschylus produced in 458 the play The Oresteia. It, every playwright, when they uh, performed their uh, productions for the Athenian audience, presented three plays and then a sort of re comic relief play. These were put on in one day, and of all of these plays, The Oresteia of Aeschylus is the only one that has come down to us complete in that we have all three of the tragic plays put on that day. The first one, the Agamemnon, the second one, the Libation Bearers, and then the third one, the Eumenides. 
uh, the, audi the audience already knew something of the background of the Agamemnon, who was Agamemnon. But playwrights could be very bold in changing these uh, plays, changing the stories. And in this case, Agamemnon is not king of Mycenae, he is king over Argos. Now, all of these tragedies were meant to work on three levels. First, there was just the story itself, the entertainment, the drama. Two, there were the higher moral truths that were to be considered. But third, there was the relationship of the tragedy to contemporary Athenian politics. And in 461, Athens had gone through a complete political change. Up until 461, it had been a balanced democracy with a supreme court, the Areopagus. In 461, Pericles won an election. Young at that time, he was a radical Democrat, encouraged the Athenians to remove their supreme court so that any law the Athenians passed remained law. There was no overturning a law of the people. And at the same time, Pericles led the Athenians to break with their older policy of working together with Sparta and instead began to maneuver against Sparta for Athens to become the absolute number one power in the Greek world. And the first step in this was to make an alliance with the inveterate enemy of the Spartans, Argos. So as a tribute to this new alliance, King Agamemnon is ruler over Argos. And the audience knew the background of the house of Atreus, Atreus being the father of Agamemnon. It had begun in far off Asia Minor, in Phrygia, and there had ruled King Tantalus. And the gods bestowed all favors upon Tantalus. And he became so swollen with pride that he was the favorite of the gods that he tested them. He took one of his own sons, Pelops, chopped him up into pieces, cooked him up in a stew, and invited the gods and goddesses to dinner. Well, immediately they all recognized what this terrible stew was in front of them, except perhaps Demeter. She was distraught over the loss of her daughter Persephone, and she munched away at a shoulder bone. But as soon as they realized it, they put Pelops back together, the little boy. One part of his shoulder was missing, so they filled in it, it in with ivory. And they punished Tantalus. What was his crime? Hubris, outrageous arrogance, but also cannibalism. And this should be your lesson, that cannibalism is always wrong, and the Greek gods will not have human sacrifices. It's not always true, but that was a lesson. Well, King Tantalus was sent down into the underworld where he was placed in a stream, given constant thirst and hunger, but every time he moved his head down to take a drink from this cold stream, the water receded, and over his head hung grapes and pears and apples. But every time he would reach up to try to get one, it would go up into the air. And so he lived for eternity, hungering. The story is already known to Homer. It's a very old one. And Pelops, having been restored by the gods, comes to Greece. And there he wants to pursue the most beautiful woman in Greece at the time, Hippodamia. Notice how these beautiful women always get the heroes in trouble. But her father, King Enomarus, king over Elis, which is the area in which the Olympic Games are performed, uh, had a very uh, difficult way of dealing with suitors for his daughter's hand. The father would challenge them to a chariot race. And if they won, they could have his daughter. But if they lost, they paid for it with their lives. And already 13 young men had tried, and their heads were on poles in front of the king's house. But Pelops made the same bet. 
and he prayed to the god Poseidon, who was his patron divinity, to help him win. And Poseidon gave him a fleet horse and an invincible chariot. But you know, Pelops wasn't content to leave it that way. He didn't quite trust the gods. That again is hubris. And so he bribed the chariot Tyr, the man who took care of the chariot of, uh, of the king, to instead of fixing the wheels this time with bronze, to fix them with beeswax. When the race began, and at the very f full speed of the king's chariot, suddenly his, he his wheels went off, and he went flying out and was killed. Now part of the bribe to Myrtilus, the uh, man who worked on the chariot of uh, the king, was that he could sleep with Hippodomea, Hippodomea the first night. Well, of course, Pelops wasn't going to keep that, so he killed Myrtilus. Once again, treachery, death, hubris. But Pelops lived on, enjoyed his life, and became king over Elis. He had two sons, Thyestes and Atreus, and both were eager to have the kingship because the kingship over Elis also included the kingship over Argos. Atreus won out in the struggle, and Thyestes, in anger, seduced the wife of his brother, seduced his sister-in-law. And Atreus at first banished him, but then Thyestes came back, the behest of his brother, who said, all these things happen, you know, uh, uh, she's beautiful, you couldn't help yourself, let's be friends, we're brothers, we need to work together. Of course, he didn't mean that at all. And what he did is take not Thyestes, who had committed the crime of adultery, but two of his three sons. The youngest was still just a baby, maybe not enough meat on him. At any rate, the two older sons were chopped up again, cooked into a stew, put before Thyestes, and since he wasn't a god, he didn't know this wasn't a delicious lamb stew, and instead gobbled it all up. And when it was over, his brother pulled out from the pantry the two heads of the, th of the sons. There, now do you know why you cannot betray me? Well, nothing in, in excess. Isn't that the motto of the Athenian tragedy? Yes, it's bad that Thyestes seduced the wife of Atreus, but hubris lies in punishing not the guilty, but in these two innocent boys. And is adultery really a strong enough crime to punish the, by cannibalism? Well, the little boy grew up, Aegisthus. Atreus continued to rule over the land of Argos, Elis. But this house is stained with these horrors, the horror of Tantalus, the horror of Pelops betraying his trust, and now the horror of Atreus committing this terrible crime against his nephew. But Atreus himself passed away, and rule fell upon Agamemnon. And it seemed now as though the house of Atreus had found calm and clear waters. Menelaus, the brother, was king over Sparta. And when the great war came, as we have seen, Agamemnon was chosen to lead the Greek forces against Troy. Yes, he had to sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia, but the gods told him to do it. And he could never be the great conquering hero unless he led this mighty armada. Troy was captured, and he returned home, as we have seen, with Cassandra, the daughter of King Priam. She was a prophetess. She had been beloved by Apollo, the god of prophecy. But she refused his advances, so he punished her. She could be a prophetess, but no one would ever believe her. 
When Agamemnon arrived home, we have seen how, in this first play, the Agamemnon, he is welcomed by his wife, Clytemnestra. She embraces him. She has taken a lover, Aegisthus, but Agamemnon knows nothing of this, gives her orders, take care of my girlfriend, Cassandra, walks out on that red carpet that we described, goes into the house where Clytemnestra and her lover kill him, stab him with swords and smash him with a battle axe. And then they turn upon Cassandra. Before she has been killed, Cassandra shrieks out, this is a family that drips with blood. This is a family that is cursed, that generation after generation, horrors will be piled upon it. But at the end, Clytemnestra and her lover stand boldly before the people of Argos. She will now rule over the land. And her own son, Orestes, is driven into exile. So the first part of this trilogy, the Agamemnon, in which Agamemnon is, pays for the sacrifice of his daughter, as uh, Clytemnestra says, he cut her throat as a charm to sway the winds. So yes, as a mother, I must pay him back. Can there be anything worse than killing your own daughter, even if it means killing your own husband? Well, her son Orestes thinks, yes, that killing your husband is far worse than his killing your daughter. And in the second part of the play, of the trilogy, The Libation Bearers, the play is called, it opens up with Electra, the daughter, uh, one of the remaining daughters of Agamemnon, standing over the grave of her father. She is there with a number of servants, all of whom bring libations to pour upon her father's grave. She's weeping. What a horror my family is. How my life has been scarred for my girlhood. My mother killing my father. My father having killed my sister. And then my brother, gone far into exile. We've heard nothing from him. And my mother, with her lover every day and night, shaming the memory of my father. Oh, what pain. Oh, look upon my father's grave. There's a lock of hair, two locks of hair. And these little footprints, someone's been here. She reaches down and picks up the locks of hair. Why, they're like mine. And the footprints are exactly the same as mine. Who could it be? And then stepping out of the shadows, it is I, your brother, Orestes. You've come home. I've come home. I've brought a friend with me. And together we're going to do the task we must do. Do it. And I will help you any way I can. Do it. Kill mom and kill her boyfriend. That's exactly what we intend to do. They go to the palace. Are ushered in. They're not recognized. Orestes left as a little boy. He's come back as a man, grown. His own mother doesn't recognize him. They introduce themselves as two travelers who bring her the news that her son, Orestes, has died in foreign parts. Oh, she says, well, it's, it's too bad he never came home, but he simply couldn't understand why, why I had to do what I did. No, and he still doesn't understand. I am Orestes. What an unnatural mother you are not even to recognize me. I've come to kill you and your boyfriend. In fact, I'm going after him first. And stabs and stabs the lover. And now, Mom, I'm coming to kill you. You can't kill me. I'm your mother. The god Apollo himself told me, says Orestes, that I must kill you. 
that I can only rid this house of its long, horrible history if I kill you. Well, mom's not going to go down easy. She picks up a battle axe and comes after him. But he knocks the battle axe away and then pulls forth a sword and she says, here, strike my womb. And he does. And she's dead. And he goes out before Orestes does, the new king of Argos, and tells the people of Argos what he has had to do. And they agree. They cheer him. But suddenly, he begins to look off into the corners. His eyes get wilder and wilder. They're after me. They're after me. What? what what's after me? Those women, those women with the snakes in their hair. They're after me. They're after me. And it is the Furies. Those ancient goddesses whose task it is to avenge the murder of a mother by her son. So they began to pursue him, and he loses his mind, and he breaks out in a terrible leprosy-like disease and flees Argos. They are after me. They are after me. So again, the horror falls upon this family. The third play is the Eumenides. It starts at the shrine of Apollo, where Orestes has fled, hoping that the god Apollo, who has ordered him to kill his mother, will take pity upon him. And the god Apollo tells the Furies, you cannot pursue this man anymore. It is our ancient right to pursue him. We will hound him. We will hound the scent of blood. Apollo tells Orestes that he must go to Athens. Remember our Athenian tradition. We always help the weak, the pitiful, the cursed. Orestes flees to Athens. Apollo makes the fury sleep for a short while. When Orestes and Apollo arrive in Athens, they turn to the great goddess of Athens, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. The Furies present their case. He killed his mother. It's as clear as it can be. And Apollo presents the interesting argument, a very typical argument of the sophist. Well, a mother really isn't a parent. The father is all that matters. The mother is just, you know, somewhere where the father's seed grows, but she doesn't add anything to it. So he really didn't kill anybody important. The bad thing was she killed his father. And Athena agrees with this because Athena had no mother. She sprung right from the forehead of Zeus. And she says, I will always take the part of a man in any struggle. The vote is cast. It's a tie vote. Athena votes for acquittal. And so, according to Athenian law, Orestes is acquitted. But says Apollo to the Furies, you are not to be shamed and humiliated. We will henceforth change your name to the Eumenides, to the Blessed Ones, and here in Athens you will be honored forever. The higher truth within this dark, dark tale in which the guilt of the house of Atreus is finally washed away by divine intervention. The gods care very deeply about right and wrong, but the Greeks already understood that there are families that do seem cursed, that generation after generation, the same terrible disease, let us say, strikes them. They already understood dimly what we today with our science understand about genes and DNA. And it raises a question so crucial to the Greeks. Do we really have free will? If your DNA is such, no matter how much cabbage you might eat, how much you might exercise, if you have the DNA for the genes for breast cancer, you're going to get it. If you have the genes for a degenerative neurological disease, you are going to get it. 
You have no choice. So what the Greeks called fate, that all things are set out before your life really begins as a person on this earth, from the moment you are conceived, your whole life is laid out before you. And as the Greeks already knew, what truly matters is how you respond to what DNA or fate has dealt you.